welcome to this edition of the Native News Update on this Tuesday, November 16th. I'm your host for today's program, Paul Demain. Many of the stories read here can also be found at our website at IndianCountryNews.com. And here are some of the news stories for the day from the Associated Press and other Native News sources. The Navajo Nation is set to build its first casino in Arizona on newly acquired trust land. Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs Larry Echohawk has announced that 405 acres east of Flagstaff were placed in trust for the tribe. The Navajo Nation Gaming Enterprise bought the land along Interstate 40 for $7.4 million earlier this year and gifted, to, gifted it to the tribal government. Federal approval was needed before gaming could be conducted there. Tribal officials expect to open the $120 million Twin Arrows Casino next spring. Plans call for a hotel, conference center, spa, and golf course at the site. New York's latest attempt to tax non-Indian customers has generated mountains of legal briefs, hours of arguments, and a seemingly consistent flurry of court decisions. What it hasn't generated is any of the roughly half a million dollars per day in projected state revenue from those cigarette taxes. Collections were to start September 1st, but legal challenges by five of New York's Indian nations have indefinitely delayed them. The five Indian nations are pursuing multiple challenges rather than a single united one because each is an independent entity with its own government. Priorities and business models to protect, authorities said. The strategy has not only lengthened the legal debates, but also has put the state's lawyers in the position of defending the same tax law against multiple attacks, each coming from a different perspective. Federal agencies plan sessions in the Rockies and across the country on working with Native Americans on suicide prevention. Those meetings began on November 15th and in February of next year will come to an end. The agencies involved are the Indian Health Service, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and the Interior Department's Indian Affairs. Interior Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs Larry Uckelhawk says tribal leaders have asked for coordinated suicide prevention and intervention efforts, especially among youth. A national conference is planned February 10th in Arlington, Virginia. You can get the full schedule about that and locations of those meetings at IHS.gov. And we'll put that URL up there. And today we go to Arn Vanio, MD, who is a family practice physician practicing in the Fond du Lac Ojibwe Reservation in Cl Cloquet, Minnesota. Last year, Dr. Vanio helped produce a movie called Walking into the Unknown. And that's at walkingintotheunknown.com. But today we're talking to him as part of a collaboration of the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism, who are pulling together several newspaper articles and videos from around the state of Wisconsin for a project called A Tragedy, A Tribal Tragedy, and a look at teen and other suicides in Indian country and perhaps the whys and how we can prevent more from occurring. These stories and more will be posted at the WisconsinWatch.org on November 21st, along with the full 32-minute interview here of Dr. Vanio, linked to Indian Country TV, and much more. In the Native community, they talk a lot about the historical trauma as being part of the impact. Um, you're a doctor, and I suspect that you're living a fairly healthy lifestyle physically and mentally because of the tools you have available. Mm -hmm. Has the thought of suicide ever passed through your mind yourself as a way out or as some kind of a solution or, or does your experience weigh in the other direction when you think of that? Well, you know, I don't think about it now, but, but I was overtly suicidal when I was in my late teens and, um, I started, you know, I grew up around alcohol, and, you know, every Saturday, every Friday, Saturday night at our house when I was growing up, when I was a little kid, was, you know, drunken aunts slobbering on you, and who loves you more, and, and, uh, stupid drunk talk, and, um, hangovers in the morning, and fights, and, you know, fights all night long, and people throwing things in the house, and, and, uh, screaming at each other, and calling each other names, and, you know, I thought, when I was a little kid, I thought I would never touch alcohol you know to, to be that stupid and um, but I started drinking when I was 13 or 14 years old and I actually drank with my uncle and my mother and you know my mom had this 
she wasn't a bad mom. She was a good mom. And, you know, after my dad's suicide, you know, she had all these kids that, and she, you know, she eventually had, she had five, four of us by my, by my dad, and she had two more kids after she remarried, and, and, uh, you know, and after my dad's suicide, she wanted to keep us as busy as possible, so we swam a lot, and we went, you know, did a lot of different things, and, you know, poor people things, because we didn't have any money, but mostly swimming in the rivers and things like that, but, you know, she, even when I was, I don't know, 13 or so, she had this logic that I was going to drink anyway, so if I drank, I might as well drink with her, and, you know, that was so empowering, and, um, you know, to be able to drink with adults, and, and it, you know, that was, uh, I liked it, and it, to be accepted into that, you know, adult world like that, um, and I drank with my uncle. My uncle used to, he took an interest in me after my, after my dad died, and I would, I would have done anything for him, and I, I tell people that if he was a bank robber, that's what I'd be right now as a bank robber. He used to wake me up at two, three o'clock in the morning, and he just all he'd have to do is just just touch my shoulder and say Arnie, and I was up, and I didn't care where we were going as long as I was with him. And we used to net fish and shine deer and you know shoot deer at night and and you know I have all these ways that I know now how to avoid game wardens, and we'd make our fish traps out of rusty wire so they couldn't see it from airplanes and and um, and he was teaching me these things, but but the, you know but he was teaching me and. You know, and for me to start drinking with him, we used to we used to spear fish on the and legally, but um, you know go spearing fish from a fish house on on lakes, and you know we'd leave at four o'clock in the morning and we'd be there just when the sun rose and and you know we'd be drinking blackberry brandy and peppermint schnapps and beer all day long when I was you know thirteen fourteen years old and and you know as I started drinking more and more, um, you know whenever I got drunk I'd think about my dad. And so during this time of empowerment, the alcohol not only empowered you as a young man, but you reminisced in a way oh, yeah. about what was going on, and not necessarily positively. No. It, and, you know, I, I could never think about my father and his death when I was sober because it was just, it was just too hard. You know, but then, you know, when I was drinking, then that's mostly what I thought about. And... You know, and I would drink and cry and and uh, think about suicide and think that maybe, you know, that I was responsible for his death. And that was the biggest thing. Even as a little kid, I always thought that I was responsible. I was too much of a burden and, you know, bills and having to feed kids and, and all that stuff. And, and, and I really did think that. And when I was, I don't know, maybe 16 years old to 20, you know, then I thought about suicide a lot. And when I was maybe... 17, 18 years old, then, you know, for, I don't know, three months, better part of a summer, you know, I was actually, I was overtly suicidal, and I had a, a, a roadrunner, this really fast car, and, and I always thought that, you know, and I, and I really did think that, you know, I'd go out in just a flaming wreck, and, and, you know, I'd get the high school annual dedicated to me, and, you know, people would remember me forever, and I'd be a hero, and, you know, and, you know, I don't know how I, I could think that, but, but I did. You know, and my, my father's suicide put so much hurt on me and my brothers and sisters and my mother and, and everybody around us. But, you know, I mean, that's, that's the way I thought. And, and um, it, you know, and it, that could have happened any time during that, you know, that summer. Would, would you attribute a great deal of people's slide into actually committing suicide very much related to alcohol and drug use in the native community? Oh, I th you know, I think so. And, um, y you know, alcohol and drugs, you know, they start out numbing things. And, and um, you know, as I was growing up after my dad's suicide, you know, and, you know, to think about that when you're, you know, to think about it when you're sober and thinking right is very, very hard to do. You know, but as soon as you, you lose some of that inhibition with, you know, with alcohol, and I was certainly using drugs then too, and uh, mostly marijuana, but experimented with just about everything else I could get my hands on. And, um, you know, I, I, was, I was not suicidal unless I was drinking or using. 
And, um, you know, from a personal standpoint, yeah, they're connected. My father was drinking heavily, you know, during a time that he was suicidal. He was probably drinking when he was, when he shot himself. You know, he had a bar and, and uh, you know, I mean, it was just alcohol and, and um, drinking, that was just a way of life. You've embraced a lot of native traditions uh, during your lifetime and during your, your growth period. You went through some rough times drinking, um, going to school and, and not going to school because yeah. you've, you failed there. Um, has, tell me about embracing native traditions. How, is that a helpful uh, situation to infuse into the native community? Is, is, that, is that suicide prevention? Yes. And, you know, th th there are so many things that are suicide prevention, but, you know, coming back to my traditions saved me. And, um, and there's a few other things, but that's one of the big things. And, and my mother was, um, she was Mede, and she went to ceremonies. And, and my, my grandfather, going back to historical trauma, my grandfather was taken from his family and put into a, into a Catholic boarding school. He was beaten for speaking his language. He was beaten for practicing his traditions. And even though he was a fluent speaker, he would he would define things for us. If we asked him what something meant, he would say it, but he would never speak Ojibwe around us, and he wouldn't speak Ojibwe around my mom. And when she was growing up, he didn't want her learning traditional things because of the hurt that would bring on her. And um, in order for her to do her practice her traditional beliefs, she ran away from home when she was 15 years old. And she was extremely traditional. And, and I was, as I was growing up and, you know, during the times that she was trying to teach me things, it was the time that I was drinking. And, you know, and I was pretty wild. And didn't, um, you know, I didn't listen to the things that I should have. And, but somehow I think there's, a lot of that stuff comes back. And sometimes it comes back to me at times that I don't expect it, that I remember something that she said or things that she would do. And, and um, Maybe you didn't listen to her, but you still heard her? I think so, you know, and I think there, I think there's a lot of that. I think, you know, now we worry that maybe our kids aren't listening to us, but maybe they are. And if you look at a lot of the elders that, that people look up to, um, you know, any good alcohol counselor has been at the bottom. You know, they've been rock bottom, they've been drunk, they've been, you know, they've lost everything. And those are the people that really understand where people are coming from. You know, for, from, from a suicide standpoint, you know, people that have been there, I think, are the ones that, you know, that best understand that. But, but suicide prevention happens, you know, it's not just people that have been suicidal that are good at that. And, and I talk to people about, about suicide, and even with my own, um, even with talking about this, and even with talking about suicide in public and on film and, and other things, when I talk about it, it's hard. And I was at, uh, we were showing Walking Into the Unknown, we were showing the film at a church uh, last fall sometime. And, you know, the, the feedback we get when we show that film is so powerful and so positive that uh, it, it's, it's really, it's, it's humbling. But, um, but at the end of it, there was a guy that came up that was in his maybe 60s, early 70s with a cane, two canes. He was having a hard time walking. But he was there when my father committed suicide. And he told me that. And, you know, I didn't know that there was anybody left alive to talk to about that. And, you know, as much as I've talked about this and want to know about things, I couldn't talk to him about it. You know, I can't mix my highs and, that, and my lows like that. And I still, I still have a talk to him. You know, I need to get a hold of him. And, you know, it was that was hard, you know, knowing that he was there and, you know, wanting that information, but at the same time, not wanting that information. And, um, you know, and I do need to, I do need to go and talk to him about that because, you know, I do need to understand some things better. And that is the latest roundup of news from Indian Country on this edition of the Native News Update. We want to thank you all for joining with us. Come back again soon. Miigwech.